Or did you just watch Land Before Time? You're so chill today. <laughs> he used to just stomp around the house and roar all day long, and it was so loud. <laughs> we got little brother, and you know he's trying to take a nap, and Titus is roaring, and uh, you know, and you're going, please be quiet. <laughs> Stop, your brother's trying to sleep, and now I'm like, oh, I wish I could hear that roar again. But um, yeah, dinosaurs were a big, big deal, huh? My hubby and I have two beautiful boys, Titus, who is five, and Eli, who's two. Titus is inquisitive, sweet, very caring, joyful, so adventurous, he's always up for anything, and trusting. Eli is really mischievous, he's silly, he's nosy, loving, really quirky, and quite amusing. <laughs> These are my boys, and, um, and I need you to know them defined by these things before they're defined by anything else. And about two, we started noticing a little bit of a speech delay. And so, you know, we did early intervention. We had all the professionals going, yes, we'll, you know, get this going. Well, he'll be caught up in no time. It'll be okay. And then at three and a half, we got a phone call that um, he'd had a seizure at school. Well, then in a matter of those two weeks, we had several, like six to eight more seizures. I know the title of my blog is Can't Steal My Joy, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. This blog's just my war cry to show that I won't lose like that. But this week, my joy was stolen. Our search for answers ended this week, Tuesday, at 11.45 a.m. to be exact. And we are left with the ability to do only one thing, love. Titus is diagnosed with a rare genetic disease called late infantile NCL. It's progressive and it's fatal with no cure. This disease will take our sweet boy away before he can experience being a teenager. There isn't anything we can do to, re to reverse the bad genes or to heal him. And I find myself saying to Titus over and over again, I love you. From April to the end of May, we watched him go blind, um, lose his ability to talk and his ability to eat by mouth. And um, he is wheelchair bound. Nothing spirals you into living in the moment quite like the type of news our family has had to hear. And today we had to hear it again. Our baby, our Eli, is also affected by this monster we call Batten disease. He will follow in the same path as, as his brother. As I spoke to our genetic counselor today in our two minute phone call, my first word was a devastated, no, both of them, Lord, both of them. The kids won't grow old and we won't have grandkids or just have the joy of them growing up. So when you look at it, what's our purpose? We have different roles, different, different avenues of which God's taking us. And you know, our two innocent boys are on this avenue that God has, I guess, designated for them. If one person can get saved through their death, then that's worth it. We want people to understand that God can work through such ugly circumstances and it's about like this loving God who loves them just as much as He loves us and our boys and we want people to see His love in action, you know, so it's like one of the big reasons I feel like I want to tell our story. Yeah. Let's go eat some breakfast. <laughs> He's like, this oh. is weird. All right, come here. Uh, if we help them, they'll play catch back and forth. And we try to have Eli like share his toys. And you know, he's got all these balloons, like give a balloon to Titus. And he wants to kiss his brother goodnight and give him a hug. It's been a gift. Fully feeling pain lends itself to fully feeling joy. I do feel anger, sadness, fear, but I also feel joy. What God has given me rises above circumstances. My joy is purely based on the beauty of who God is, not the ugliness that has come upon our family. My joy is based on a God who is good and loving, who feels this pain with me, who's in control with our best interests in His heart. This doesn't change, and it won't change if a cure is found to save our boys, and it won't change if this disease takes them away from us. 
I choose to see life through the eyes of joy in the here and now, through the eyes of thankfulness in the here and now. So now I know I can have joy even in this. <laughs> I hadn't watched that in a while. Thank you so much for letting me join you all. I'm excited to be here. This is um, such a privilege. I think of this as a little COVID gift, getting to meet all of you um, because we have to be on Zoom. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. And, uh, you know, I hope what I have to share today is, is um, bolstering for your faith because it is for mine as well. I know that um, what I have on my heart to share is not anything new, um, but every time I talk about it, I feel strength in that hope that Jesus puts in my heart as I talk about it. So um, so I guess a, a, an update on our family. So that was taken back in 2015, um, just, oh goodness, eight, seven, eight months, after our diagnosis for Titus. And um, what followed that diagnosis with Titus was just a whirlwind. I, I call it whiplash. I still look back and, and I feel whiplash over what we experienced because um, 18 months after Titus was diagnosed, we um, entered the end of life stage with him and um, paired words like hos you know, hospice with my son. And I, I never entering into my parenting journey thought that that would be the direction we'd ever be going with our kids. And so hospice came in, um, you know, we had hospice on, on really from the beginning of our diagnosis because we knew it was fatal um, and there was absolutely nothing that could be done. They had no treatments or anything. Um, it was just comfort at that point and managing symptoms. And um, so September of 2016, we, um, we knew that Titus's body was done. I mean, there were things just failing and it was obvious that he, his fight was over with this disease. And the last week we had him, we sat there, um, you know, just by his side 24 seven all week long. We had family coming in and out of the, the house and friends and doctors and therapists and teachers and everybody coming in to say goodbye and to be with him one more time. And um, I, I call this kind of my moment when pain and joy clash together and pain and hope, I should say, clash together in such a huge way. We were literally counting breaths of Titus's, how many times he was breathing per minute and my, my phone went off. I got this email from a doctor in Ohio um, about this clinical trial that was just opening back up. And it was an enzyme replacement therapy. Um, and unfortunately, Titus would not um, qualify for it, but Eli would, because we knew his diagnosis so early before he had any kind of um, symptoms of anything we were able to advocate for him pretty early on. And um, this timing was crazy. So I'm sitting there counting my son's breaths and we get this you know, text or uh, email that Eli is getting invited in to get spot four out of five in the United States to be part of this trial. And they wanted us there as soon as possible. Um, Titus passed away on the 17th of September and on the 27th, 10 days later, we climbed on an airplane and flew to Ohio to get Eli brain surgery and get him started on these infusions. Um, such a whirlwind. And in that time frame, that six months that kind of followed um, losing Titus, we traveled from Southern California to Columbus, Ohio every other week for six months. And it was nuts. I still look back and it's kind of a blur. Um, but Eli was the youngest at the time to get treated in the entire world. He was three years, three months old. It was before he had seizures, difficulty walking, any of those real big symptoms that come out that are so hard to control or get back. And so he is now um, almost eight. He'll be eight in July. Titus passed away when he was six. 
So, you know, you can see what a difference this infusion has made. And Eli, um, let's see, in two days, he'll be walking into the hospital for his 115th infusion. And he is a, a miracle. <laughs> I just, I, I, I do feel every day I'm witnessing miracles in him. We were just on a call with a, a pharmaceutical company in Washington, D.C. on Friday, and I was sharing all the things that he was doing, and they're just shaking their heads because a child who is almost eight with batten disease should not be doing these things. And he is walking um, independently. He is um, still learning, developing. We just had his IEP meeting this week and he has actually achieved goals and we got to write new ones, which was huge. I can't even, I just said, I had to hold back tears during the IEP meeting because I've never had an IEP meeting like that before where we've been able to write new goals because he's achieved the old ones. Um, he's still, you know, obviously this is a treatment, it's not a cure. So it has slowed the progression of the disease dramatically, but it's not stopping the disease. So Eli has lost all of his vision. He is blind. He lost it kind of between four and six years old slowly over those couple years and is completely blind now. Um, and so we are, we're navigating what that looks like. And he is, um, he is not, he doesn't have good language skills. He definitely communicates in many, many ways and gets his point across um, in very creative ways and very loud ways sometimes. <laughs> but he um, just is a joy to anybody who comes across him. And I wish he was here right now that I could introduce you guys, but... Um, you'll have to hop on our Facebook page on team. It's team four, the number four, Titus and Eli. And we are, poor child, we spelled it E-L-Y. Okay, so look for Eli with a Y. It's not Ellie, it's Eli. <laughs> we cursed him. Um, everybody in the waiting room at doctor's offices will come out, Ellie? I'm like, I think you mean Eli. <laughs> so anyway, but you can look for us there. And I we update pretty often on there about um, how he's doing and all the things. So, well, Pastor Daryl asked me a couple of questions um, to think about as I was preparing what to share with you guys. And he asked, you know, what has God revealed to me about himself? And what has God revealed to me about myself? And so I wanted to share some of that with you. And actually, while we were worshiping, I was kind of laughing because I think Pastor Armani pretty much took my message. So thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but I just, I loved that song, the river song. I've never heard it before. So that was just beautiful. And then you go into the cloud of witnesses and I, it, it was just spot on. So I'm going to share. Um, and like I said, I don't feel like I have anything new to say here, but these are things God revealed to me during the, the deepest, darkest places that I have been in my life. And things that he continues to reveal to me. And so I know that even if we know it, it's good to keep talking about these things because it bolsters our faith. It gives us a foundation, a firm foundation. And um, being here today does that for me. So thank you for, for bolstering my faith. So first, before I go into what I've um, felt like God has revealed to me about himself, I want to talk about, um, you guys have talked about joy already, so hopefully I don't contradict anything that you've said, Pastor Darrell, <laughs> but I'd love to talk a little bit about the, the trouble with that word. Um, people often refer to me as the joy girl, you know, because I wrote Can't Still My Joy, my blog was Can't Still My Joy, joy was my war cry, and so I'm often thought of as the joy girl, and my boys both always um, radiated joy, like people just they're like, you, your family is so joyful. Um, but sometimes that conjures up this picture of someone who's happy and vibrant, maybe someone with a gift of optimism, um, someone who's maybe figured out how to control the narrative of their circumstances so that they can like avoid pain and just find happiness. And um, I find that when people hear me say, can't steal my joy, and they hold kind of this shallow definition of joy and what it is and where it's found. They look into their own broken circumstances and suddenly 
that joy that they think I have that somehow I've attained like by my own strength is unattainable to them. And that pains me so much because I want people to understand that I'm not up here. Like I haven't figured out something magical um, that isn't accessible to any one of us that God hasn't given to any one of us. So, you know, I just thought I'm going to get real with you guys right now. I want to give you a little peek in because I, I think a lot of people see the, you know, the joy, but this journey has taken me to dark, dark places. I mean, there have been times I have wondered, am I better off if I died? Is my marriage better off if we were separated? Um, I've sludged through more mundane and seemingly pointless days with brain fog and confusion and sleep deprivation than I can even count. And I've hidden in the bathroom <laughs> to scream and cry. Um, I've had some words with God that probably should never have been uttered on holy ground. And I'm so thankful for his grace and mercy in those places. And it wasn't in my ability to power through, think hashtag positive thinking, pull myself up by my bootstraps. It wasn't in those places where I found joy. It was actually in those desperate places where this new definition of joy was revealed to me. And so the first thing that God revealed to me about himself was this characteristic of faithfulness. And in his faithfulness is where I found joy. And so I found his faith, his, I learned about his faithfulness through a few different ways, right? So reading his word, being in, this, in the Bible, um, and just pursuing him in that way. Um, I found his faithfulness just in how he responded to me in my desperate moments. And through my community, I learned about his faithfulness through the acts and the hands and the feet of my community who were being Jesus to us. And I, I learned, you know, this is where I, I was like, ah, oh, Pastor Romani was on it because he started talking about Hebrews 12, 12, 1 and the great cloud of witnesses. And for Christmas, I got this devotional um, to memorize, to walk me through memorizing scripture. And when I opened it, I was kind of like, okay, <laughs> here we go. I don't even know if I can do this anymore. I can't tell you the last time I've on purpose memorized scripture. And, and these were whole chapters that they were going to have me memorize. And I was like, oh, I mean, like, let's do like a, you know, Proverbs three, five through six or five. I see, I can't even tell you three, five and six, seven. I don't know. And, and it wants me to memorize a whole chapter. But I was like, all right, we're going to, we're going to try this. It's a new year. Let's, let's go for it. Um, it was Hebrews chapter 11 that it started me off on. And I, I just finished memorizing it probably about last week. The last few verses are still a little fuzzy, so don't test me on it, but I, I've got most of it up here now. And Hebrews 11 for me was just this grand picture of God's faithfulness. It was talking about all of these people who faithfully walked through unknowns. I mean, it talks about Abraham. When God tells him to leave his home and go to a land that God would give him as his inheritance, he went without knowing where he was going. Noah obeyed when God told him about things that had never happened before. Sarah, she believed that God would keep his promises, even though she was old and barren and too old to have a child. And we see over and over and over again how God is working through this big, grand redemptive story that he's inviting all of us to be a part of and he's made these promises and what has hit me over and over in this chapter it says so many times that like one of the verses all these people died still believing what God had promised yet none of them received what was promised they saw it all from a distance and they welcomed it because we're a part of something bigger Right. And so I think about my own life and how I want things to work out just like how I laid them out. And, and, you know, I want to get out of life what I feel like I'm putting into it. And I see these, this cloud of witnesses, our faith heritage, just doing the exact opposite of that. 
stepping into the unknown, believing that God is faithful and that he keeps his promises and that we are invited into that story. And even when our itty bitty little temporary life ends, that, can, that story continues and we can look at it from a distance and we can welcome it because we still get to claim it. It's just not maybe right now. And so for me, that was huge, just learning about God's faithfulness and being a part of his big grand story. And the second thing, when I soak in the reality of his faithfulness, I feel hope, which for me ignites joy. And hope comes, it, it carries an invitation. It's despite the circumstances we are in, we get to participate in what God is up to. And not just like what God's up to in the future, but what he's up to right here, right now. And so Mark 1, I love Mark 1, um, when Jesus is just beginning his public ministry. And this verse, um, I actually had read it so differently all my life, but it's in Mark 1 and it's um, chat, uh, verse, verse 15, 14 and 15. And it says later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. And whenever I read that, I always thought he's saying the end times are coming sometime soon. That must be what, you know, repent, the kingdom is near. And just recently, I've started to see this from a little bit of a different perspective. I think what Jesus was saying in this moment is the kingdom of God is breaking in. It's close. It is so near. Come, it's here. You get to be a part of this right now. Repent and come be part of this. And it's this invitation and this uh, into a great rescue. And we get to dare to hope. And so God has given me that hope. And in this place of hope for my story, I started to learn to reframe my requests and my questions. And so one of the things that I would often ask or maybe just inherently try to fix is my pain. Like I'll ask, how can I get rid of this pain? You know, we heal this Lord, just fix it. Um, sometimes I wouldn't even go to him. I would just go to scroll social media and mind them. So I didn't have to think about things. And instead of asking, how do I, how do we get rid of this pain? We can ask how can God be glorified in this place? You know, how can I participate in the kingdom breaking in right now? And so that is where, when I ask that kind of question, joy ignites in my soul. I learned at the, this is before our diagnosis, but we were having uh, major issues with Titus. I mean, baton disease was definitely coming out. We just had no answers yet. And um, lots of seizures. It was scary. And I remember sitting down to journal one day and just going, what is going on, God? What is happening? You've got to give us a lifeline here because we are scrambling. And I was just praying for healing, praying so hard for healing. And we had people around us that were praying for healing and well-meaning people that would come say, you just need a little more faith and your son will be healed. And um, man, that was just hard. That was hard to hear. And, um, and I couldn't understand. I really searched inside, like, am I stopping God from healing my son? Like, what is this? And I, I, when I really examined, I believe without a doubt that God could heal my son and that he would if that was his plan. And it, but in that journal time, I sat down and I just started scribbling out my heart. And God, God met me in that moment. And he said, Becca, this is not about a physical healing. This is about a healing of the heart. Your story is going to bring heart healing, which is actually eternal. Whereas a physical healing is temporary. And I think so often we, hold on to God showing up in the biggest way he could is through a physical healing and fixing the problems that we're facing. When God showed me very clearly that our story was going to be one where we were going to walk through some pretty dark, treacherous pathways 
and he was going to heal hearts along the way. And that was going to be an eternal hope that we could all hold on to. And so I held on to that, um, which leads me to the third thing that God revealed to me. And that was that I found joy in this dramatic perspective shift. And I just want to share, I don't think I could really say it much better than I already wrote it in my book. Um, this moment where I was walking, you know, we lived in, in California, we had neighborhood with lots of walking paths and Titus loved to go outside. And when he lost all of his abilities to walk and talk and see and all the things, um, we actually were able to get him this really cool adaptive bike and it, it locked him in in every place. So he was very secure. I had a handle on the back and when I pushed, it would move his feet, pedal his feet. So he felt movement. He couldn't do it on his own. But we'd get out every day and we'd go walk on these paths. And, you know, it, it was hard for me because I would, it, I'm pushing this child who before was like running circles around me and exhausting me with his energy and jumping and climbing and slamming doors and running out the door. And, you know, um, and suddenly he's completely dependent on me in this, this bike. But we had, I wanted him to still experience what I knew he loved, which was getting out into nature and being part of um, just feeling the sunshine and hearing the birds sing. And I was having kind of a, a little pity party for both of us on this particular walk. I was feeling like this is unfair. There's like in my limited perspective, I felt like his experiences had been stolen from him. And I just, I was asking God, like, what kind of life is this? And that's when, um, that's where I want to start sharing with you what I wrote. It was on one of those walks, though, where I, I experienced a major perspective shift. I learned that blindness was indeed a big problem. Blindness stole experiences, the ability to see beauty, to identify things that maybe we declare as our favorites. It was a big problem indeed, but in my discovery, I realized blindness was not a problem for my son. True blindness isn't physical, it's spiritual. And it was a plague that had affected me. So often in life, we believe we already know what good looks like. We think we know what whole looks like. And then something doesn't match up with our definition and we defend against it. We make it out to be criminal, to be wrong, to be avoided at all costs right? Like get rid of the pain. When you come to an intersection of life where you believe it should go one way, but there are construction cones and blockades that only allow you to take the other direction, you have to change your plans quickly. Life had taken me down another road. I needed to pay attention to it rather than think about what it would be like to be on the road I had wanted to turn on. To live in that space, wishing for another way fed bitterness to my soul. It stole away my ability to be thankful for what I did hold in front of me. I was blinded by shadows of fear. I was blinded by my injustice over what life took away. I took my trust and I held it tight, not gifting it to anyone or anything. If I did extend the hand of trust, who or what would come to crush it next? This truth began washing over me as I walked Titus around the lake, his eyes unseeing, but still beautifully blue, long lashes falling over his lids. How I ached at what he was enduring, and yet right now, he didn't seem to be suffering. Perhaps there was another way to see life as we knew it. Perhaps there was more beauty to be found than what I believed was there all along. But what did it take to see such beauty? In Matthew 10, 37 through 39, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of being mine. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. And that was when I realized all along, it hadn't been about this 
extreme God who puts his thumb in our back and demands that we follow a list of rules and regulations and allegiances. But this was about a God who says, don't let this world blind you. See me. Look to me. When you look up, daughter, you will see my faithfulness, my love, my grace, my purpose, my redemption, my victory. When you look up, daughter, and follow me, you will find eyes to truly see. You will find a purpose worthy of giving your life for because in it, you will find life itself. And that for me was a huge perspective shift. When I stopped focusing on my circumstances and allowing them to feed my emotions and my response and my understanding about life, and instead I shifted to what was true about God, I was able to live in this place where I was in the middle of a storm, but inside I felt calm. I felt God's peace. So I wrote, I just, you know, during our time, uh, especially with Titus, I found that I needed to keep these troops close to me. And so I actually grabbed a dry erase marker and I scribbled these things all over every mirror in our house. <laughs> I had scripture that was, you know, reinforcing these truths that I printed out and I put on our kitchen cupboards. So every time I opened a cupboard door, it was right there. Um, I put them down in my journal and I, I just prayed through them every day. And the, the truths that God just kept bringing to my mind were, Becca, this is a temporary world. It's one where we're invited to be part of the eternal, even as we're here in this temporary world, but this is temporary and God will redeem. He will make things whole again. And I scribbled out, he's faithful. God always keeps his promises and Jesus always holds the victory. At the end of every one of my journal entries in the morning, I'll, you know, I write my prayers out because I love to express through words and, and I get done, I say, amen. And then Jesus has the final say. And I underline it every time because that for me is it. Jesus is our victor and we get to claim that. And so, like I said, these truths that God revealed to me came through reading his scriptures, spending time with him, and through being in my community, being with people, and allowing them in to do life with us. Um, you know, I didn't plan to say this, but there, there's something about allowing people to serve you. <laughs> it's really hard. We like to be the ones who are helping and to look like we've got it together. We're, you know, we can help other people, but we're good. We don't need any. And for me, I just found that was the essence of the gospel, learning how to flex the muscle of receiving. Um, and God put such an incredible community around us um, as we participated in his big story, you know, with our itty bitty little one. And so, you know, my joy didn't come from prosperity <laughs> or success or, you know, just uh, positive thinking. It didn't come from my dependence on my circumstances, but it's on a loving, faithful, victorious God who will not change. And that is where I found true joy and continue to find true joy. And so I hope that that is, um, that speaks to your hearts today. And what I, as I was preparing this, I just thought, how beautifully God's faithfulness and his hope and this, these perspective shifts that we're called to point to Jesus. All of it points to Jesus. And I've always, um, for many years, actually write joy with a capital J because I believe joy is Jesus. Um, I don't think we get it any other way. So um, I know we're going to do some Q&A, but I would love to first pray before we move into anything. Lord, I just thank you so much for getting to be part of Reconcile LA and Mexico Church and getting to be here with these incredible people. At the beginning, I just wanted to sit back and be able to listen to their stories. I thought, who am I to sit here and talk about mine today? 
I know that you are up to amazing things, Lord. And I just, I pray that you bless each person here today. And I, I pray that you just fill them, fill them with your faithfulness, help them be able to look back and remember how you have been faithful, not just in their own stories, but all throughout scripture and your big story. You are the same faithful God then and now. And I thank you so much for your promises that you will keep. And I pray you fill them with hope. Help them lock on to the victory that you have already claimed and you have promised can be ours if we just accept you, Lord. And I thank you so much for the perspective shift you can give us. It's so countercultural. But Jesus came and turned culture on its head so many times and told us about the kingdom of God and how it is breaking in right here, right now. We get to be a part of it. Give us strength to see in that new way. And as we you know, go out into our week and find very quickly how easy it is to shift back into those old perspectives, give us insight and, and just convict us and help us see how we can see new again, how we can open our eyes and take off our blinders. I thank you so much for your incredible love and for your joy. Amen.